Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to welcome all of you to the Duke Law Journal's 51st Annual Administrative Law Symposium. Though we wish we could be meeting with you in person, we are thrilled that hosting over Zoom has allowed us to welcome nearly 500 guests today, which I can only assume is our largest turnout ever. It's an exciting day because we'll hear from leaders in administrative law and because it represents the culmination of a year of great work on behalf of the journal and our wonderful authors. We had no idea how odd this year was going to be last February when we reached out to professors Kristen Hickman and Aaron Nielsen with an off the wall proposal. The journal was in the process of the February article selection when we came across their paper, Narrowing Chevron's Domain. It occurred to us editors that the future of Chevron deference was a critically important topic, especially with the possibility of a change in administration in January 2021. So instead of our traditional practice, which is to invite symposium proposals on any administrative law topic, we ourselves reached out to the professors to see if they would organize the symposium for us, to which they agreed. It has been a great partnership. Together, we selected excellent draft articles from professors that we're excited to hear more from today. This symposium issue, which is now published, contains truly exceptional work. I like to say thank you and recognize all of the Duke Law Journal editors who helped get our eight, that's right, eight articles to publication. Your work has been exceptional and it's been a pleasure serving on the journal with you this year. I'd also like to specifically thank Professor Stuart Benjamin, the Duke Law Journal's faculty advisor for his guidance and counsel in support of the symposium. He is the ideal faculty advisor, thoughtful, patient, always available. Thank you too to the journal staff at Duke, Christy Compost and Jennifer Behrens for your assistance throughout the year. I also want to thank and introduce Becky Thompson, the symposium editor who has helped make this symposium happen and is literally hosting the Zoom event today. This has been a difficult year in many respects, but for the Duke Law Journal, now in our 70th year and beginning the second half of a century of admin symposiums, we feel stronger than ever and we're proud to facilitate this gathering of scholars, practitioners, and other interested law students. We hope you enjoy the program today. In between panels, we'll take 15 minute breaks and during those breaks, we'll poll, poll the audience on fun yet divisive questions like, which Chevron step is your favorite? Step one, step two, step zero. If you're Professor Nielsen, you're welcome to write in step one and a half. I trust you're all laughing, but just on mute. Finally, it's an honor to welcome Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit to deliver a keynote address to kick us off. Judge Sutton has served on the Sixth Circuit since 2003. Before that, he was Solicitor General of Ohio and a partner at Jones Day. He has argued numerous cases in the United States Supreme Court and served as a law clerk to both Justice Powell and Justice Scalia. Thank you for spending time with us today, Judge Sutton. Happy to do it. Um, thank you, Christian, so much for inviting me to participate in this wonderful symposium. Uh, congratulations to you, your staff, Duke, uh, Professor Nielsen, Professor Hickman, really impressive uh, group of articles which I've managed to read and or skim. Um, it's kind of daunting to do a keynote in this context, but um, uh, maybe it's just a good way to get things started off and maybe hear the perspective of a judge on some of these topics. So, um, you know, there's not too many amusing features of COVID, uh, I think we would all acknowledge, but I do have one story that perhaps registers a little bit on that scale. So I teach quite a bit at Ohio State Law School, like uh, one of your panelists, uh, Professor Walker. And um, like a lot of law schools, Ohio State was trying to figure out exactly what to do uh, with COVID last fall. And so they, you know, they offered Zoom, they offered hybrid, and um, I decided I'd be willing to go down to the law school and offer hybrid, which is to say, uh, be live with maybe half of my students and have the rest of them on Zoom. Now Ohio State, um, really was trying to be very responsible about this and they had a good kind of a goodie bag, a, a COVID goodie bag for adjunct and other professors in their first class. And so they had all kinds of stuff, you know, Ohio State mass, wipes, instructions, you name it. And then at the bottom looked like a, a little bottle of water. Um, when you're teaching hybrid, it's very difficult because you've got to have a mask because you're live with some students and that's no fun for the folks on Zoom. They can't really read you. Um, and plus it's, it's just not fun to have a mask while you're speaking for two hours. 
So I was really happy to see this bottle of water and because uh, you can always take your mask off to drink it. And I thought I'm gonna use that quite a bit during this seminar. Um, just as class was about to begin, I thought, oh, it's a good time to get a drink. And maybe it's about a minute before class starts. And I reach into the goodie bag, unscrew the bottle, take a big gulp, and then paused. I thought, wait a second, this is not water. I had just taken a big gulp of sanitizer. Um, let me not recommend this to anyone. Um, you know, and it's very awkward, right? This is my first class. We're still in the drop period. I thought if I tell them what just happened, no one's going to stay in this class. So I calmly walked through the class to the back of the auditorium and happily <clears throat> one of the water fountains was still working. And I was trying to remember my science, my seventh grade science. Is this one of those poisons where you want to drink lots of water to dilute it? Or is this one of those poisons where you want to do something else to get rid of it? And I thought this has got to be a dilution situation. So I drank a bunch of water and um, managed to teach the class, uh, did not tell the students what had just happened until after the drop period, which I think was quite clever, maybe even manipulative. Um, this is not something worth trying. It takes a very long time to get this taste out of your mouth. So now that you have a sense for the mental aptitude of your quote, keynote speaker, um, listen to what I have to say. Um, I, I wanna um, look at this from four different um, perspectives, um, this topic of the future of Chevron. And um, one will be the perspective of, you know, my own autobiographical path as a judge for almost 18 years now. Another will be the perspective of Justice Scalia, uh, no mean observer of administrative law. A third will be a perspective of the, um, the states. In fact, this borrows from a chapter of a book I've got coming out next year that talks about state constitutions and has a chapter on administrative law. And then the fourth, assuming I have time, will be um, a few potential areas for reform on the assumption that Chevron is not overruled. So my own path as a federal judge, um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, for the first eight to 10 years, I love Chevron. Um, as a matter of whether the doctrine made any sense, I didn't really get past two realities. Uh, Justice Stevens wrote Chevron and Justice Scalia was its biggest defender, at least for most of his tenure on the court. Uh, the Justice Stevens and Justice Scalia Venn diagrams do not overlap a lot. And I figured when they do overlap in such a conspicuous way, this approach to biblical truth, there couldn't possibly be anything wrong with Chevron. The second reality of Chevron as a judge is I love the fact that it um, frankly made my job easier. Uh, we could have diverse ideological panels and once we saw an ambiguity in the statute, it would bring us together. So it was a judge unifying doctrine led to a lot of unanimous decisions um, in, in panels where that might not have been expected. Uh, the third thing I really appreciated about Chevron uh, related to, a, I guess I would call it a worldview of mine, both before being a judge and since, and that's my nervousness that the federal, the imprint of the federal courts on American policymaking is vast and, and really so beyond what the framers would have imagined. And whatever else you say about Chevron, it shrinks, diminishes judicial power, uh, right? It's, it's leaving the power to the executive branch and the agencies. And you know, to the extent the concern is not just separations of powers in American government, but balance of power, um, I, I saw ways in which that was quite healthy. Now, the last, what I'll say, five to eight years, it's hard to put a finger on it. And most of this is impressionistic. I haven't gone back to actually get numbers on this. But th things have really changed. Um, Chevron no longer is resolving disputes. In fact, I can't remember the last case where Chevron, in step two of Chevron at least, resolved the case. Um, the Whether Chevron should apply at all now has become an issue that divides panels rather than unifies them. Whether Chevron's a good idea and people wanna be embracing Chevron supporting decisions is something that's uh, generated a lot of sensitivity in many of my colleagues. And so oddly enough, it has become a lot easier to resolve these cases at what people call step one of Chevron, but you might just as well say on pure statutory interpretation grounds with any implications and inf without any implications and inferences. Um, you know, 
I'm sure, quite sure the experience of a DC circuit judge would be different on this front, but at least from a Sixth Circuit perspective, were Chevron overruled, it really wouldn't make that big a difference, at least as things are right now in my court. It really is not resolving many cases. And reminds me a little bit of John Manning's observation about the non-delegation doctrine written a couple decades ago, but the idea being that it really operates more as a constitutional avoidance doctrine. And one wonders if that's not, if there's not something similar going on with Chevron, that no one wants to deal with the big picture separation of powers issues of Chevron. And therefore we're just doing the hard work of finding the best interpretation of the statute. Um, I don't know whether that's the case, but um, you know, the only other thing I would say in terms of the future, um, as a practical matter, while it's possible, um, our panels may not be invoking Chevron as often as we once did. Um, whether it's Chevron, Skidmore, or something else, um, I still think there's a practical reality for judges. And that's that if we're dealing with a highly reticulated, complex statutory scheme, think of, think of the one at issue um, in Chevron itself, um, you know, stationary, non-stationary sources, the bubble concept, I, I suspect judges are still gonna have some form of deference, whether it's more in their mind than on paper when it comes to what the agency has said about how a statute ought to be interpreted. So let me shift to the second perspective and that's to think a little bit about how Justice Scalia thought about these issues. Um, he's no one to sneeze at on this point. Um, he, he was an administrative law professor. He practiced administrative law. He served on the DC circuit. And on top of all that, he cared deeply about structure and separation of powers. Um, and yet um, he never um, joined a non-delegation decision Well, there wasn't one during his tenure, but he never was pushing even in concurrences in dissents the way uh, then Justice Rehnquist had done earlier in his tenure. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, he's, he was a very big defender of Chevron for most of his tenure. It's really easy to look back and say, you know, what was he thinking? Um, well, the people at Duke have one sense of what he was thinking because he wrote a um, significant article in 1989 for the Duke Law Journal, good for you. Uh, this seems to be an area of expertise on top of basketball. And um, that article really was a full-throated defense of Chevron. Uh, what were some of the things he appreciated about it? He liked the fact that it created a clear background principle uh, for Congress to legislate against. I, I think it's fair to say that was true then, it's true now. It does require Congress to be doing something, but the point is a fair one. I think um, Justice Scalia appreciated the ruleness of Chevron. He had a, a significant speech article, the rule of law is a law of rules. Uh, he wrote pretty early in his tenure as a judge. I think he'd been a judge in justice for about seven years when he put that piece together. And I think he appreciated the clarity of Chevron when it came to limiting the authority of the federal courts. And that gets to, I think, a, a third point, which is consistent with my perspective, which is not a bad way to control the influence of the federal courts on American government. Um, but Justice Scalia gave a second speech about 20 years later, I think it's about 2009 at American University, where it's quite clear he was having second thoughts about Chevron. Um, I, I, he was not a fan of Meade. Um, you know, what's Meade's you tailoring deference to variety? Uh, that's about as far away as you can get from a Scalia approach to law and a ruleness approach to law. He was quite concerned that the benefits, the ruleness benefits of Chevron had disappeared. It seemed he was getting more sensitive to the separation of powers concerns embedded in, in Chevron and for that matter, our deference, um, Seminole Rock deference. Um, so he was having second thoughts. You know, one thing he never did say, but I've always thought was a very good explanation for his second thoughts about Chevron and I, it seemed growing ambivalence is to think about his career and some ways in which American law changed, uh, definitely in the federal courts and maybe across federal and state courts. You know, when Justice Scalia came of age as a lawyer in the 70s, uh, when he was practicing administrative law, working executive branch in the 70s, um, the federal courts in general, but the DC circuit in particular uh, was a pretty inventive court when it came to statutory interpretation. This is not 
by way of criticism, it's by way of describing what was going on. There were not too many shared assumptions about how one does statutory interpretation. When I mean, you don't have shared interpretations about how to do statutory interpretation, ambiguity, everything's ambiguous and you can do just about anything with it. Um, and I think Justice Scalia took the view that in a world in which there was so little predictability about what the federal courts, including the US Supreme Court at that time, when there was so little predictability about how they were interpreting statutes, um, it made some sense to have this um, change in regime, which, you know, Chevron's not the only case that initiates it, but it's the one that gets all the attention and credit, that it made some sense if you couldn't, if judges didn't sh share interpretive principles that it really did start to degenerate into political judging. And that's, that was the fear anyway. And if that's what's going on, it really ought to be something that we put in the hands of a group of people, the agencies that report to an elected official, the president. And so his view of statutory interpretation, his skepticism of how it was working in the 70s and 80s are very consistent with thinking Chevron made a lot of sense. Uh, an independent reason for Justice Scalia to second guess that and for others who care about textualism to uh, second guess it is things have changed quite a bit. Um, you don't have to agree with everything Justice Kagan said when she said we are all textualists now. Of course, we still have King versus Burwell. We still have difficult statutory interpretation cases, but it does seem we're in a very different world when it comes to statutory interpretation. And consistent with that, you know, Justice Scalia was always a step one Chevron guide. Like, you know, he often resolved the case there, but if he didn't, all bets were off with the deference. What's really seems to be going on to me right now is the significance of Chevron is really diminished because there are more shared principles of interpretation. And it's consistent with my experience on the Sixth Circuit that more often we are able to figure out ways to figure out what the statute means, what that best reading is, and not have to get into what to do if it's ambiguous. So that seems to me an independent reason, which I'm not sure he ever gave for what seems his growing ambivalence, um, which, you know, sadly he left us in February, 2016, and God only knows what he would have done had he stayed on the court, but there's no doubt he was having second thoughts. Third perspective, um, um, that's my hobby horse. Um, people invite me to speak, they have to hear about state constitutions for just a little bit, uh, so forgive me. Um, but I, I do think there's some useful insights that the state court experiences offer when it comes to the future of Chevron and areas perhaps for reform or if or even reconsideration. Um, so we often think of the states as laboratories in lots of ways. Um, and we, you know, one thing that I had not appreciated until doing the second book project is to appreciate the growing gap between the national government and the state governments at just so many levels. But at, at one level to just start how the national government is democratic and non-democratic non at the outset, 1789. It's got, of course, some democratic features, but many, many non-democratic features. Um, you know, life tenure for federal judges, difficulty of amendment, um, you know, the electoral college, two senators per state. So there's just lots of what you would say are non-democratic features of the national government. And the national government largely has stayed frozen in place because it's so hard to amend when it comes to structure. Um, that has not been the case with the state governments. Um, it's just, a, it's a one-way line um, or one-way trajectory as they get more and more democratic. Um, so of course they, 90% of the states or 90% of state court judges are elected. Uh, they not only elect governors, but they have a plural executive, so they can elect AGs and secretary of states and superintendents. Uh, the states have put far greater limits on their legislatures. Uh, so Keith Whittington has an, a piece about how the non-delegation doctrine is alive and well in the states, and that's, that's quite true. So there, there, there are limits that are placed on the legislature through elected state court judges, and of course, the states, uh, 24 states, have some form of direct democracy, whether it's initiatives, amending constitutions, or referenda that could alter statutes. And so the laboratories of states 
continue to be more democratic laboratories and continue to be laboratories that I think give us really revealing insights on what Americans want. And Americans eventually are gonna get what they want one way or another. And so it's, it's a really useful place to look. So what, what is going on at the states when it comes to, I've already indicated that they enforce a non-delegation doctrine in, in ways that aren't remotely true at the federal level. But something similar is going on when it comes to administrative deference, uh, which is really another non-delegation. Think of uh, non-delegation as an express issue and Chevron type issues as an implied issue. They're all about delegation. It really comes back to the exact same point. And when it comes to the implied delegations, um, the states do not follow Chevron, um, which is very unusual because typically state courts have borrowed a lot from the federal courts when it comes to constitutional law, individual rights, and for some reason, structure is just not an area where that has happened. Um, so just two states, to my knowledge, expressly follow Chevron, just you know, say we follow the federal doctrine and we do the same thing here. Um, there are probably 12 states that do something like Chevron. So I think it's probably fair to say roughly 12 do, but the rest do not. Um, and many are quite um, extravagant in disagreeing with it. Um, it's remarkable to me how current uh, and politically, um, how much political valence there is on this topic right now in America. Proof of that is that in Florida in 2018, uh, Floridians passed through the initiative, a constitutional amendment to eliminate deference to agencies. I mean, that's just stunning to me. It's, it's significant enough that we Americans, when we hear Chevron, think of administrative law and not a gas station, but the, the reality that 62% of Floridians even know what someone is talking about when they talk about deference to agencies and eliminating it is, is really quite striking. Um, Two other states that same year, Arizona and Wisconsin, their state legislatures eliminated Chevron. You have several state court decisions, a very good Mississippi Supreme Court decision, which eliminates it as a matter of separation of power, state con law. And before the Wisconsin statute uh, was enacted, they had a, a state Supreme Court decision where two of the seven justices said as a matter of state con law that that should be changed. So the, the states are, taking a very different path when it comes to administrative deference. And one thing that's, one lesson that emerges from that, and I think this is a partial response to one of Justice Scalia's purported concerns about getting rid of Chevron is, is the worry that there's so many statutes out there, wouldn't this just shut things down if every interpretation of every application of a tariff law had to go through the federal or state courts, um, wouldn't that just shut things down when it, come to, when it comes to implementing federal and state statutes. And the state experiences show that hasn't happened. The sky has not fallen. And um, that of course is where most law is done. You know, you, proof of the significance of the state courts is the last time we had statistics on this, there were 80 million cases, civil and criminal filed in the state courts for a given year. And the counterpart figure at the federal level was 400,000. So, you know, you wanna figure out how the rule of law is working or could work, um, could work. Getting rid of deference, changing the deference regime at the federal level. Um, what's going on in the state suggests the sky is not gonna fall. You know, from the originalist perspective on this, some of the state court decisions are really fascinating in part because quite a few state constitutions not only imply separation of powers by having an article one and article two and article three, the implication being if you separate, separate the power of the president, uh, that's distinct and the legislative branch should not be exercising that power. The states have what I think of as belt and suspender, not all of them, but most of them have these additional provisions. I'll, I'll, I'll quote the Mississippi one. Um, and what it, it's, the Mississippi one says no person or collection of persons being one or belonging to one of these departments shall exercise any power properly belonging to either of the others. Um, Mississippi is far from unique. Uh, the first Massachusetts, Virginia, several other state constitutions had these belt and suspenders guarantees. So you not only implied separation of powers, you actually said no one in the legislature can 
um, exercise the judicial or the executive branch power. Now, the history behind these, um, you, you, everyone can go read Gordon Wood for themselves, um, but the, the his, there's some, some suggest the history suggests that these guarantees are meant to be separation of personnel and not separation of powers of provisions. In other words, the idea was to prevent a state legislator from also being a state judge. Um, there is no doubt that that is one of the things Montesquieu was focused on. But even if, even if they're thought of as separation of personnel provisions, think of how that works with modern agency law, right? The, the head of the agency arguably is getting all three powers at once, right? They're arguably getting the power to interpret the law, uh, to decide as a matter of policy what it should be, and then to implement it. So you're combining all three, not just two, but all three in one place. So, you know, someone who's sensitive to these, the originalism and, and you know, folks including Gordon Wood, and well, actually Justice Scalia, I think says this in Morrison versus Olson, quoting the Massachusetts one, these are fair game, these extra provisions, these are fair game in trying to figure out what the federal constitution meant when it was ratified in 1789. Uh, true or not, the, the bottom line is the states, that that could be one explanation for why the states have been skeptical of deference to agencies and much more willing enforcers of the non-delegation uh, doctrine. So let's get to three potential areas of reform. We'll see what I can do in the last um, eight minutes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a sitting federal judge, so I have to be a little bit careful about um, the, the question presented, uh, should Chevron be overruled? Um, if I had one, one general thought about it is, um, and maybe this just shows that I'm a bit of a conservative in the old fashioned sense that um, I just would say it's a lot easier to criticize a doctrine uh, than it is to replace one. And so one should just be careful about the, the many, many vulnerable areas of Chevron in my view. Um, I'll talk about a few in a minute. But um, uh, sometimes uh, it's it's a little easy. It's, sometimes it's just as well to modify as it is to completely replace. In fact, you can almost you can almost get a great lesson from Chevron itself that it didn't mean to be, I think, recreating anything. I think it meant to be pushing the deference button just a little bit harder. And maybe the real answer today is push it a little less hard and be a little more sensitive in where it applies. Um, so I have three areas. Um, you, you have the same problem with judges um, as you do with professors when you want to talk about ideas for reform. Basically, all they want to do is talk about their articles and their books and well, the judges, it's their opinions. Uh, so forgive me because that's a bit of what I'm doing here. Um, but I, one area of reform, the feature of Chevron that is quite mystifying to me is how it applies to um, well, criminal law and, and really what I call dual application statutes, statutes with criminal and civil applications. Um, you know, as a general matter, whether it's delegation or Chevron, criminal law is a really wonderful area to think carefully about this because the retroactivity issues and, you know, taking someone's liberty suggests very good reasons to be sensitive. And, you know, that of course was the Gundy case, which was a criminal case. So, in one sense, there's no problem in this area because the Attorney General of the United States does not get Chevron deference in construing a run-of-the-mill criminal statute. But what's quite odd is that we have lots of statutes that have dual applications. Um, and when I say lots, I don't think I'm exaggerating. Um, you know, the last time, at least that I've seen the numbers, in 2008, someone said there were 4,500 federal criminal laws out there. And going back even further, 1990, someone said there were roughly 300,000 regulatory crimes. How could there be 300,000 regulatory crimes and just 4,500 federal um, criminal statutes? And the answer is dual application statutes. And what, what goes on is you have a, a statute that sets a standard of care. It could be the IRS, it could be securities law, environmental law, immigration law is a very good example. And you have a civil standard, um, and then you have a statute at the end that says, well, if you violate these provisions, you violate them in this way, um, it also counts as a criminal violation. 
And then you have statutes that say, if you violate the regulations promulgated under the civil statute, you, you have criminal liability. So the, the issue of dual application statutes is what, quite significant. And there's another feature of this, which is that it's a matter of statutory interpretation to date. The US Supreme Court has said, when the same statute applies criminally and civilly, it gets the same statute, it gets the same interpretation, um, right? I mean, words aren't chameleons, they mean the same thing in both settings. It would be very strange to have the standard differ from application to application, and perhaps also a little bit confusing. This sets up a really interesting conflict. Um, if you have an ambiguous statute with criminal and civil application, what triumphs, rule of lenity or Chevron? Um, rule of lenity says an ambiguous criminal statute should not be enforced retroactively against an individual because it's ambiguous and they would have had no notice that what they were doing violated the criminal law and subjected the possibility of a prison sentence. On the other hand, a Chevron suggests the ambiguity is, you know, is government power enhancing. Um, in a case called Babbitt from 1995, in a footnote of all things, don't get me started on footnotes, um, the US Supreme Court said um, Chevron triumphs. Um, it's not the clearest opinion. Um, the court had a case called Ex Esquivel Contends where they had a chance to clear this up, uh, pivot away from Babbitt, or, or for that matter, pivot in favor of Babbitt. And they ducked the issue of well, ducks a little unfair. Uh, the individual did win, um, but they did not clarify the issue. That strikes me as an area ripe for reconsideration. A second area I'll be quite brief on is in tax law. This doesn't apply nearly as often, but I still find it so strange. Um, the IRS and the federal courts, um, thanks to the IRS and thanks to the willingness of the federal courts, there's a substance over form doctrine in tax law, federal tax law, that is, the states don't do this. In one sense, substance over form makes perfect sense. You look through the form of a transaction to determine its true economics before deciding um, the tax consequences. For example, you can't give someone something and call it non-income under the relevant IRS code and think it's not gonna be treated as income. That's, that's obviously quite legit and fair. What seems very strange is the courts and the IRS also use this doctrine even when the statute's clear. In fact, the very point of the substance over form doctrine is when the statute's clear, when the taxpayer has complied with the statute, and yet it seems to present an op opportunity for tax evasion, which I appreciate the IRS's concern here, but it is very strange because what's going on is you have a situation where at step one, the government loses. <laughs> And the substance over form doctrine allows them to get over a loss at step one. I mean, that's, that's more consequential, that's more deferential even than Chevron. So it's, it strikes me as quite amazing to have a world in which there's a doctrine that is more deferential even in Chevron in America circa 2021, which gets me to my last point. And I guess I have to confess returns to my hobby horse of the states and federalism and all the Jeff Sutton biases that come with it. So one thing to think about, this isn't necessarily a reason to overrule Chevron, but it's a reason for sensitivity and thinking about Chevron going forward. And it is trying to remember the state's role and how they have dealt with these issues, denying deference, enforcing non-delegation, and keeping that in mind when we think about what the federal regime should look like. In other words, paying attention not just to horizontal separation of powers, which is the key issue in the Chevron debate, but paying attention to vertical separation of powers at the same time. In other words, all structure, national and federal, um, federal state relations structure. And that, that seems to me worth thinking about. So in a very significant case in the mid, mid 80s, uh, Garcia, the US Supreme Court said, Congress can regulate the states, including even setting the wages of state and local employees and that there really wasn't a federalism 10th amendment type limitation on congressional power. The answer for the states was to protect themselves in the, I'm now quoting, the halls of Congress when it, the national government, the national legislature was debating the potential regulation either of the states themselves or of an area of 
local police power where the states have had a big role traditionally. And the thing that's odd about Chevron and hard to reconcile with Garcia is how, how does a state protect itself in the halls of Congress when the statute being debated is ambiguous? Very hard to know what to say when you don't know exactly what the law is going to mean. The power of course goes to the agencies and where exactly is the source or avenue for the states to protect themselves in the halls of the federal agency. And that gets to the last point, which I think is the most consequential. If you're an interest group and you very much favor one form of regulation versus another, think of how much wiser it is to use the federal government in general and the relevant federal agency more particularly. If you're confident that that agency will implement the statute in a way you like, this is a beautiful situation because you nationalize the rule you prefer and most significantly you end run all the hassles of state regulation where they do not permit agency deference. They, do, they enforce the non-delegation doctrine. So one really remarkable oddity of our current situation is the government with the most power has the least separation of power restrictions on it. And we've enabled them to end run all of the process separation of power restrictions the states historically have placed in this area. And I would say are ramping up their protections. So the incentives for Chevron continue to grow and the, the disparity between what the two sets of government are, do, are doing really continues to increase. So um, it's really been wonderful to be with you. Um, thanks so much for hearing my thoughts and um, congratulations once again on just a remarkable set of papers on such a vibrant topic and um, look forward to hearing some more and um, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Sutton. Really appreciate your time and speaking with us. Um, friends, we have about um, five minutes, seven minutes before our, the first panel starts. Um, so we can take just a quick break while we